Okay, thank you. And, and hello, everyone. Um, so I'm Rachel Andrew. I'm not an accessibility expert, so I'm slightly nervous about speaking at an accessibility conference. That's certainly not something that I claim to be. What I am is a web developer and a writer who cares about accessibility. And I try to keep up to date and I try to make sure that the things that I'm teaching people and the things that I'm writing about and when I'm working on CSS specifications, because I'm a member of the CSS working group, I try to sort of keep accessibility in mind. And if I don't know something and I think, hang on, this might have an implication, you know, I'll go and try and find out from somebody who does know more. And so I think that, you know, a lot of web developers are probably in that same situation. You know, you wouldn't call yourself an accessibility expert, but the fact that you've turned up at an accessibility conference, then, you know, I, I think you, you're probably a web developer who cares and wants to know more about it and wants to sort of make sure their work is accessible. So that's really where I come from with this. Um, I'm someone who, who knows quite a bit about CSS and I try to know stuff about accessibility and I'm also always trying to learn and trying to figure out more about the different needs that people have. And I think that's really important right now because our CSS layout systems are changing uh, and they're changing very quickly. We, we sort of had this this massive change a few years ago with, with Flexbox and then Grid, and we're getting other things built on top of those systems. And that's kind of happening at, at, at quite a reasonable speed when it comes to the web platform. And when we get new stuff, then we get good stuff because we get new ways to do layout, and that's really exciting. But we also potentially get some problems. Um, you know, when we get any kind of new technology, it could well have some unforeseen problems that, that we didn't think about maybe when the spec was being designed or weren't thought about in the, in the implementation, or perhaps just bugs. And we'll be talking about a bit of that later today. So this talk is mostly me speaking my brains about these issues, because uh, I want more people to talk and think about the potential issues of new layout so that we can fix them. So I've got a few things. I'm going to talk about the accessibility issues raised by new layout. So what specific things have we already identified as being a problem? And then, you know, how can we avoid them in our own work? But also I want to think a little bit about how the platform can evolve to help. You know, so we're not just saying, oh, don't do all these things. You know, what else can we be doing to help? So CSS Grid. Now, one of the first things that I thought was exciting about Grid and really what got me sort of dragged into this whole thing where I began kind of promoting it long before it became uh, available to use in browsers. The thing that I thought was exciting was that it gave us for the first time a proper separation of content and presentation. Now, I've been doing this for a very long time. And I was building websites back in the day when we were trying to encourage people to move away from tables. And one of the things that we said over and over again back then was, oh, but CSS lets you separate your content from your presentation. And that's because when you lay something out using tables, you're mixing presentational data in with your content. So if you want your heading to span over um, a number of columns, you have to actually put that into your HTML. So you're making decisions about layout in your markup. Uh, so, and that was, you know, that was how we built any sites until CSS came along. Now, even worse with tables for layout, if anyone was building sites back then, um, you remember how we nested tables into table cells and we'd take basically a picture of a website and we'd slice it up and we'd jam little bits of it into different table cells and fragment all of the content you know, all over the table, which made it terrible for accessibility because the content was, you know, jammed into table cells. It was a bit like doing web design in Excel. Um, so tables weren't great. And that's why those of us who are really keen to move people along, one of the things we were saying was, you know, you're separating your content from the markup. And so we had sites like the CSS Zen Garden, which I'm showing a, a screenshot of here. And that was all about this idea. You know, it was one set of markup and people would come along and they'd design a style sheet that would display it totally differently. And that was really just sort of to show people how powerful CSS was and how it would let them, you know, separate these two things. However, layout was still kind of tied to the document structure. Now, something we used to talk about a lot was the holy grail. Um, and the holy grail in a web design context is basically a three column layout. 
Um, and it's kind of shows how far we've come that, um, you know, back in the day, a three column layout was, was sort of the thing to aim for. The key thing about the Holy Grail was that the columns should be in any order in the markup. And that was actually really quite hard to achieve. Um, this Alista Part article that I've, I've got a link to on, on the screen, or if you just search Alista Part Holy Grail, you will find that article and you can be amazed at how much code had to be written to get this three column layout. And it gave you a three column layout. And because it was done with floats, um, then they weren't even as tall as each other. You know, there was no way to do that. Um, and this was really the best we could hope for. So in order to do this kind of layout, you did have to very carefully structure your source to get that layout to work, which you'll see if you go and look at the article. And then even more recently, now many of us have been using a float-based column uh, grid before Grid and Flexbox showed up. And these things are very much tied to their markup. Um, I've got an example of the markup here. This is from the, the bootstrap float-based grid, the sort of original grid they had before they went to Flexbox, although the Flexbox grid isn't actually that much different. Um, so you're basically going to have to have a div, which has got a class of row, and then you put your items inside that row. So again, you know, we're defining our layout there in the markup. We're saying this is a row, and these are items that are in that row. Um, and so items have to pretty much in that layout stay in source order because you're using floats um, to lay them out and floats just float up next to each other. So you don't have too much of a problem there um, with the source. So this wasn't really a bad thing. I think the fact that you know we couldn't really get too far from document structure, it stopped us all making an awful mess. Um, because it, you know, in the early days, we weren't really thinking about accessibility. We were just thinking about, well, how can we make usually, you know, something that we had in Photoshop? How could we make that look the same on the screen? But the fact we couldn't get too far away from document structure really stopped us making too much of a mess. Really, the only way uh, before Grid and Flexbox to take something out of that normal flow uh, is to do is absolute positioning. Now, if you've ever tried to build an entire layout with absolute positioning, it doesn't go too well for you. So the fact that that wasn't going to work so well for layout, I think, kind of protected us from making too much of a mess. So all we had was normal flow. And normal flow is block and inline layout. That's sort of what we call you know, the basic way that things lay out on a page. So if you stick some HTML up on the web and don't do any CSS at all, you get normal flow. You've got your content flowing in a logical source order. And so to do layout with floats, you kind of have to keep things pretty much in flow. Uh, you can move them left or right, but you can't jumble it up too much. But now, with Grid in particular, we really can have a layout that's separate from its content. We can reorder those things. We can do that at different breakpoints. The restriction of source order affecting layout is essentially gone. We can do our holy grail and switch our columns around any way we want with just these few lines of CSS. So this here, I'm showing the CSS for the holy grail layout using grid. Um, and all of the little demos that I'm showing here on screen are available online. Um, and I showed the link at the beginning. I'll, I'll put it on my slide at the end so you can go and play with these demos. Of course, we also get with grid full height columns, uh, something that we wanted to have for a very long time, um, which was impossible in the original version. So this huge limitation has gone. With grid, we really got this chance to separate out uh, the, the structure of the document from the layout. And that seemed pretty exciting at first read. You know, there's lots of things we could do. What about responsive design, being able to move things around at different breakpoints? But the thing is, the technical limitation has gone. But, you know, just because you can do something doesn't mean you should. Because in terms of accessibility, there is still a limitation. Because if you start moving things around in your layout away from the source, you disconnect the experience of somebody who is, for instance, tabbing through the layout and can see that layout. And they're sort of moving in a different order to what it looks like on screen. So we end up with this kind of visual and source order disconnect. Because the reading order of your document is your document. It's got nothing to do with a visual display. 
So if someone is just using a screen reader and having the things read out, uh, if you're just taking a document and aren't interested in the layout at all, you're probably fine. But if you're tabbing around the document or if it's been read to you and you can see it, then you could be having a very, very confusing experience. So I've got a few examples of where this can go wrong. Again, as I say, all of these are online, so you can go and tab around them yourself and see what it feels like. So here's my first one. This is grid. We've got a very simple grid layout. Um, I've created some grid columns, and I'm using grid template areas to create my layout. So I've basically got some card components, and I've given each of them um, a different place on the grid using grid template areas. It's very nice sort of ASCII art method of doing your layout. Now this gives me a layout and you know that all looks fine but you can see the numbers. This is actually playing video. I don't know whether it'll show up too well. The video is also online with my slides but as you're moving around I've numbered each of the cards so you can see the sort of strange order. Now the order of their numbers is the order that they are in the source. So you end up kind of jumping around all over the layout as you tab about. And that's not a very nice way um, to work. As I say, that's the demo there, but you can grab that from my link later. Now we can do this another way in grid. Um, in, that, in that situation, we'd actually positioned everything um, using grid template areas. So we'd kind of taken control and we'd said, you know, I want my layout to be like this, and that had caused the disconnect. Um, what about using something like auto placement? With grid auto placement, we create a grid container, and then we get our items, and we just ask grid to display them, you know, in order uh, in the container. And if grid comes across something that's too big to fit, it will move it onto the next line. So it keeps things nicely in source order for us unless we use grid auto flow dense. So turn on the dense packing mode, in which case it will pick things up that come later in the, in the markup and place them in gaps that have been left. And of course, again, this can create this very disconnected experience as you're moving around the content. And it isn't actually just grid. You can also cause problems with Flexbox. So here I've said display flex, and I said flex direction, row reverse, which basically switches the items to start from the end of the flex container. And maybe that was the layout that I wanted, but I probably didn't want people tabbing backwards through the navigation. That's really weird. Um, so you can do this with Flexbox as well. So it's this problem that I really want you to be aware of as you start to get excited about these ideas with new layout. And I teach this stuff in workshops and more than once someone has said to me, you know, I've shown them all these cool new tricks that you can do. And then I've said, but don't do that. Just don't do it. It's going to cause problems for people. And people have said to me more than once, but you're showing us all this great stuff and then you're saying, don't do it. You know, it's like you're showing us things and snatching it away again. Um, and I think that's, that's a real shame. And we'll talk about, you know, what we might do about that later. But I also want to think a little bit before we get too sad about it, how much of a problem is it in reality? Now, it does turn out that in most cases, the layout naturally follows source order as long as you keep it in mind while you're working. And that's the key thing. I think like so much of the accessibility, you know, if you're thinking about it from the start, it's not too bad. It's fine. You can do things. Um, if you build your site and then somebody says, oh, yeah, now we've got to make it accessible. It's terrible. Uh, that's the worst thing. So if you keep it in mind as you go, you tend not to have too many problems. So the first thing is don't forget about your document. Uh, you want to be able to load your document without CSS and it all make sense. Because I think it could be quite you know, easy to think, well, we don't need to wrap everything in rows and we don't need to do things in our markup. So the markup really doesn't matter. We're going to just do everything in CSS. That would be quite tempting. Um, but of course, then you lose all that semantic information that is in your document. And you lose something which is really the basis of, of, of the web, the fact that anyone can put some HTML together and put it online and it's usable and readable. And the minute you jumble up your document, you've moved away from that. So make sure that you've got a good document to start with. 
And then you should work with normal flow. So normal flow, that way that things in CSS work when we don't have any layout, um, it will really help you if you work with it. The thing about grid and Flexbox is that only their direct children become grid or flex items. Um, so once you've got your grid container and the children become grid items and you do whatever you want with them, then anything inside there goes back to normal flow because that's what happens. The, the web is always going back. The layout's always going back to this normal flow. And that actually makes your life easier because you just need to make those changes to formatting context on a container, deal with the children, and then everything inside, you know, if you've got a heading and some paragraphs, it just lays itself out. You often don't need to do very much. So working with normal flow, working with your structured document actually can save you an awful lot of time. I mean, imagine if to do a web design, you basically ended up, you know, your starting point was kind of like a jumbly mess in the corner and you had to like take every single paragraph and, and place it. Uh, it would take a long time to lay things out. So working with normal flow makes your life easier and it also ensures that the experience is relatively fluid uh, for people using, using the document. Something else about having a good document um, and, and working with normal flow is it actually makes creating fallbacks a lot easier for older browsers, for things that don't support grid. Um, so that's actually quite interesting. That's another way it'll save you a lot of time. And I don't have a lot of time to go into fallbacks today. It's not really the point of this talk, but and I've got stuff on, online about this. But quite often, you can use the cascade um, to just overwrite older layout methods. So you can float some items and then overwrite them with grid. Uh, but obviously to do that floated layout, the source order is really important because that's all you've got when you're, you're doing floats. Um, you, you know, you're still in normal flow. So keeping your document nice and ordered can actually make it a bit easier to create some simple fallbacks um, for, for uh, browsers that don't support the new layout methods that you're using. So that's also uh, quite a good reason to have a good document. So the next thing to worry about is just to make sure that you're not flattening your document in order to use Grid and Flexbox. I've already mentioned that only direct children become Grid or Flex items. And so it could be quite tempting to think, you know, I really want those list items to participate in Grid layout, but they can't because there's a UL around them. Well, maybe they don't need to be list items after all. Um, if you've worked with grid layouts or, or even flex layout, layouts for long, I'm sure you'll have come across situations where you're kind of thinking, you know, my life would be much easier if I just removed that element. And now if that element is important because it needs to be there, it needs to, you know, to infer that something's a list or what have you, uh, you don't want to do that. Um, so you need to try and resist the temptation to flatten out your markup. Now, luckily, this thing is something which is getting easier. We've already got some solutions for this. So there's two issues when, when people want to flatten out their markup. There's two things that's going on. One is that they would like to be able to have the grid inherited down through children. So you can set up, a, say, a 12 column grid on a container and then place things on that, whether they're direct children or whether they're grandchildren or great grandchildren, you can still use those same columns. And that's something that a lot of people would like to be able to do. And we've got a solution for that. It's not in all browsers yet, but we have the subgrid value of grid template rows and grid template columns, which means that your child items can inherit the grid from their parents. And this is really nice because it means you can keep those semantic structures, but still use column sizing that's defined kind of, you know, on a, on a larger container. So I've just got a little example of how that works if you've not looked at subgrid yet. Uh, here I've got some cards, sort of three cards. And if you look at the titles, they've, they've, all, got, they've, they've all got titles and content and then a button at the bottom. And the first card, the title is two lines long which means that the border underneath that, uh, that element, it doesn't line up with the borders of the two next to it because they've only got titles that are one line long. And that's a really common thing. You know, we, we, we can now get things to line up um, in, in the sort of the, the cards can line up nicely because they're grid items, but the things inside can't line up with each other because they're separate. 
So Subgrid lets us do this. Um, so here I've got um, the layout. I, I've sort of got my cards layout there and I've made each uh, child. So each um, list item in this case, I've also made that a grid and I've given it um, some rows. And if I don't have Subgrid support, it will just display as we saw with the sort of slightly wonky headings. I then use a feature query and I test. I ask the browser if it supports Subgrid. And if it does, I set the main parent um, to have grid auto rows of auto 1FR auto. So we're creating a pattern of three rows. And then each child, I span across those three rows. I set its grid template rows to subgrid. So basically, it inherits those three rows and get rid of the gap. Um, and that lets me line up those headings across the three cards. I think subgrid is going to be really, really handy for lots of things where, you know, maybe we might have thought to to remove an element or so on, um, because it's going to allow us to actually let things line up. So that's really nice. Um, subgrid's in Firefox. You can play with it in my demo online. You can go and have a look at it. It will work in Firefox. It is in development in Chrome. Um, the uh, Microsoft uh, team. Uh, said uh, last year that they were working on uh, working on grid and were going to be implementing subgrid. So I don't know how long that is before it lands, uh, but hopefully that's going to be in Chrome before too long, and we'll have subgrid to to use in our designs. And that will solve one of these uh, potential for flattening markup type problems that that we have. Now, the other reason people want to flatten out markup is that you don't want the box at all, and this is the situation where I mentioned at the start, you know, you've got a UL, you really just want the list items to fall in line with other things. Now, the way we can solve that um, is with the contents value of display. So what display contents does, if you know what display none does, if you say display none on an element, it hides that element and all of its children. So it's like it was never there. Display contents just removes the box you apply it to. So if you apply it to a UL, that box vanishes from the markup, but its children remain. So here's a fairly convoluted markup, which I don't know why you would want to have, but it sort of demonstrates the point. I've got two items which are uh, just divs um, directly inside a, a parent div. And then I've also got a UL with some child items. So that's my markup. And that gives me something that looks like this. So there's the first and the second div. They're next to each other because we're using Flexbox. And then we've got the UL. That's got the black, the black background on. So we can see that. And the actual UL has, has gone into line with the other items. And it's got a margin on it, which is why it's slightly dropped down. Um, and inside, it's got its children. But they're just being laid out like normal list items. That's not what we wanted. We wanted one, two, and three to be next to flex item one and flex item two. And the way we could do that is just set that UL to display contents. The box gets removed from the layout, and those items get laid out as if the, the box was never there. Now, that's really cool. Um, there is a bit of a problem <laughs> in that when it was first implemented in browsers, browsers implemented it a bit like display none. So display none does actually remove items from the accessibility tree. So they're gone for assistive technology as well as anyone looking at the page visually. Nothing else in the display spec is supposed to behave like that. Um, everything else is supposed to be a visual change only. But what happened with display contents is it got implemented a bit like display none, but putting the children back. And so as it was removed, it removed, for instance, the UL um, sort of from the accessibility tree. And so you might as well not have bothered doing display contents. You might as well have just flattened your markup out. Firefox have fixed the problem. Um, I think I did some, I saw the bug was changed on Chrome and I haven't had this confirmed. I did try and find out earlier, um, but a couple of days ago, I saw the bug for this was fixed on Chrome and it looks like it's fixed in Chrome Canary when I had a quick poke around. Um, I know they were working on it. So browsers are trying to fix it, but if you are relying on display contents in the future, I think it'll be a great solution for this. If you're relying on it at the moment, just test it very carefully to make sure that you aren't losing that information. If Chrome have fixed it, then you know hopefully it'll be 
in the released version soon and then will roll out to other browsers that use Chromium before too long. Um, so it, that's on the way. But those are going to be our sort of solutions. So we've got something in the pipeline to help us with that flattening markup for both situations, whether we want to keep the box or whether we don't want to have the box. So that's pretty cool. So then we've got this temptation, fixing source problems using Grid and Flexbox. And we see this with Flexbox where people use order to rearrange items. So the sort of common thing is you've got a navigation and you've decided that you want the navigation point for penguins, you want that to come first. Um, now, for whatever reason, editing the source seemed like too much work. I don't know, maybe it was coming out of some dreadful CMS that you couldn't play with. You know, it's in some templating system that no one can remember how to change. Um, and so you think, no, this is fine. We don't need to touch the source. We'll leave that alone. We'll just do it in the CSS with order. And it's really easy and very tempting. So we go into our CSS and we set order to, to minus one on, on that item. And then our layout looks correct. And we think that's great. You know, my client's gonna be happy now because that's all in the order that they want. Um, the problem is then, of course, we end up with that weird um, navigation tabbing order because the uh, tab order is still following our document. So that's something that we really don't want to be doing again. You know, don't go and fix your source problems um, in, in, your, in your CSS, um, because also it's, it's kind of one of those things that's going to get worse and worse. You're going to do it once, and then you're going to have to do something else, and you're going to think, oh, that, you know, that worked. I'll just use grid and just move those things around. And you know, eventually it ends up a terrible mess um, as the technical debt ma masses up. So avoid doing that sort of thing. Uh, when I'm assessing people's style sheets, looking for the use of order um, is something I'll just do, immediately do a search on the style sheet and see if they're using order because nine times out of 10, it's not for good things. And there are very few sort of good reasons to be using order in, in your style sheet. So we're back to age old advice. Start with a document which has a solid semantic document order. Um, I you know, was saying this nearly 20 years ago to people. This is what you start with, a good document. Um, and then if you do use any of these techniques that can cause content reordering, make sure you test it and make sure you haven't made a mess um, because and test it at different breakpoints uh, because it might be fine at desktop and then it might be fine at mobile and there might be some bit in between where it all goes a bit weird so make sure you're testing it at different breakpoints um, and the way to do that is actually quite straightforward because we're talking about tabbing through a document so we can all do that we can all take our mouse, pop it in a drawer and keyboard navigate for a while and make sure that we can get around our site and it doesn't just seem weird at any point. You know, we're not jumping around, uh, we can get to everything. And testing with the keyboard will bring up all sorts of other issues potentially as well. It's a, a really good thing to do. Um, I spent quite a while navigating with my keyboard after shattering my elbow and it's amazing how many sites um, just don't support that very well at all. Or they do for a while, and then you can kind of see where they stop testing it um, because you just get stuck somewhere. And, that, you know, and, and so it, it's something that's, that's really worth testing. Test all your use cases. Um, this Accessibility Insights extension is really great because it gives you, there, there's lots of tools in this, but one of them is a tab stop checker. And it gives you a visual representation of the path someone will take through your content. So I tried this out on one of my card demos. Um, and, you know, you can sort of, if you can see that, that slide, the, the sort of this sort of spidery path all over the layout, which is the path that the tab order is taking. Now, if you see that and you're using Accessibility Insights, you've got something wrong. That is not a sensible sort of order to go around your layout. So I think it's quite nice. I, I like the Accessibility Insights um, demo to, to, to show people um, what it looks like. And the other thing to check, and I've not really talked too much about this. I've, I've actually got a link in my resources to, to some information about this. Um, do check that changing display type, you know, so whether you change things to flex or display grid or anything else, make sure that's not changing how things are reporting to assistive devices. Uh, as I said, changing display should only change the visual display of things. Uh, it shouldn't stop a list being a list, for example. Uh, but browsers sometimes get that wrong. Um, so do check that 
make sure that you know you have got you have still got things with their semantic meaning um you know and generally as you're working with any of this new stuff uh do look out for problems and do report them don't assume that it's a bug that everyone knows about uh because as we're sort of pushing the boundaries of this stuff and as we're using you know one layout method with another and combining things um we probably are going to run into bugs and some of those are going to be accessibility bugs uh, and and you know we need to report them uh, to make sure that browsers know and and can fix them so that's kind of all the bad news you know <laughs> things that you can't do um and things that are problematic uh, and, and ways to solve it um but I'd kind of really like to try and solve this problem uh, in a better way because I think that while many you know many sites sticking close to source order is absolutely fine and I say as long as you do that from the start um, there are places where it would be useful uh, particularly when you're talking about a responsive design you know perhaps the thing that you want to prioritize on mobile is very different to the thing you want to prioritize on the desktop uh, it's not always the case but it's sometimes the case um, and so I think you know we need a better way to deal with this disconnect scenario the other thing is that more and more we're seeing visual layout builders. Uh, now, I actually got into layout by way of Dreamweaver back in the day. I did a lot of work with Dreamweaver and web standards. Um, and when you've got a visual tool, something like Dreamweaver was back then, people using it for nested tables. If you've got a visual tool, you stop thinking about the markup very, very quickly because uh, you're disconnected from it yourself. All you've got is your visual view of the website. And if that looks fine, um, you don't really think about the source. Those tools encourage the dragging around of items to make your layout. Um, very, very hard to do that and still keep the source in mind. So I think that's something that we're going to see more and more of. And we can't be blaming people who want to use a visual tool for, for messing up their source when perhaps they don't even know about it. So how do we solve this problem? Now, the first thing people think about when we talk about solving this problem is they say, well, why not just follow the visual order? That seems straightforward. And in fact, for a time, Firefox implemented Flexbox. If you change the order of items, it would change the order in which you tab through them. So they were following the visual view. The thing is, the web is basically about good defaults. I think following the visual view would be dangerous. Um, if you, you know, for, since the web started, if you put that reasonably marked up document on the web and don't do any styling, you get a readable web page. So we're used to the default being source order. That's what you get. And that's how things work. Um, that seems a solid default to move away from that seems quite scary. You know, in CSS, we have initial values of CSS properties and they're considered really carefully to make sure we don't have data loss. So we don't have things vanishing off the side of the screen or being overlapped. Again, these are good defaults. So I think tab order following the document is another of these good defaults. It means we have to take care of our document because it underpins what's displayed on the screen and what is read out to screen readers. Um, if we take the approach of switching layout to visual order, then I think it would be very easy to stop caring about document order. Um, and it would also leave us having to do more work to ensure that the, the order was sensible and also browser engines doing more work and making decisions about how this should work and also fighting any bugs that got introduced trying to make this work. So really what I think we need is a way for developers to indicate a switch to visual layout on specific components, maybe a whole page sometimes, but often parts of the page. Uh, which would mean that if there was a part of your page which used grid techniques, which might cause reordering, you could ask the browser to follow the visual layout. In terms of CSS specs, it's possible that some of the work done on spatial navigation would work here. Now, spatial navigation is actually a spec designed to let people navigate with arrow keys. So if you think about um, you know, some of the TV remote controls have arrow keys to let you move around, and it's really clunky if you have to go all the way across the top line to get to something which is over on the left. So spatial navigation would let you move around with the arrow keys. And that's quite similar um, in terms of wanting to follow um, a visual order rather than what's in the document. And it's defined in CSS. So maybe it gives us something that we could work with there. 
I also had some discussions with people at, at the very last, just over a year ago was our last CSS real face-to-face before everything went online. Um, and the thing I miss about those face-to-face meetings is the going for coffee in the breaks. And that's where we often discuss things that aren't part of the main meeting agenda, but are things that people have got on their mind. And one of those things we were talking about was an idea of being able to use an attribute on an element to say that the children inside that element had an order that wasn't important, which would mean that the developer was taking control from that point. So, you know, roughly something like that, maybe saying progress order layout. Um, So you could use that attribute. And then from that point down, you were taking control of the order. And the default would be the document order. Um, And so this would be then controlled with CSS, the actual order of things. So that, you know, was sort of an idea that we had. Now, I'm not a browser engineer and, you know, I'm on the CSS working group, but, you know, I I, I sort of deal with CSS and I've got some ideas of how I think this might work, how this would work in practice. I'm not sure. There may be better ideas. I'm sure there are. Um, But we need to be talking about it. We need to keep this conversation in the forefront because otherwise, you know, it's going to get forgotten. And I think we need to solve this before we add more new layout methods that cause more of a problem. There's already a masonry layout, um, you know, for the grid, which is implemented in Firefox that has the same problems. Um, So I think, you know, we need to solve this problem before we layer on more and more ways to do layout that potentially causes content reordering. We need to solve it before more web layout is created in these visual tools. You know, these tools are getting incredibly powerful. And I know a lot of the people behind them really care actually about this issue. I don't think it's the case that people are creating tools and completely ignoring the fact that they could be causing an accessibility problem. But just the very nature of a visual tool, the, the best you can kind of do is give people hints and say, hey, don't do that. Don't, you know, do you realize now your, your documents all over the place? Um, But a lot of people, you know, they're probably not going to care or they're not really going to understand why it's a problem. Uh, So we want, again, we want to have good defaults in our visual tools. Uh, Back when I worked on Dreamweaver, that was the thing that we said. We wanted Dreamweaver to output standards compliant code by default. Um, And so really, I would like any visual tool to be able to output an accessible layout by default. You know, if people really want to work hard to make it terrible, then they're going to be able to do that, whatever they use but let's have our defaults be really good. So I really would encourage people to talk about this. Um, You know, if you've got any way to, if you've got a blog or if you, you know, think it's important, tweet about it or come over to the CSS working group and join the conversation. Um, The issue I have posted there and it's in my resources is to, I think the most relevant issue on this subject, this is masonry layout talking about reordering and has some good examples in. Um, But, you know, I think we do need to raise this as an issue. Things get solved in the web platform because people ask for it. Um, So, you know, do come and join the conversation. And if you think this is important, make a bit of noise about it, because otherwise it will, you know, won't sort of get brought to the forefront. Um, And all of my notes, if you go to that URL, um, noticed uh, slash Rachel Andrew, there's notes and resources and code examples. So you can try out those weird tab order things uh, yourself. Uh, And I hope this has been useful and I will answer any questions. Awesome. Okay, we have a ton of questions coming in. Wow. We'll try to get to <laughs> we'll try to get to as many as we can. We have about ten minutes. Great job on timing, Rachel. This is perfect. Uh, so let's just dive right in. Okay, uh, have you implemented form labels and inputs in Grid, and can you speak to any potential accessibility issues? Um, I think generally, as long as you keep them in a sensible order, I mean, a form would be a dreadful thing to um, use auto flow dense on. Um, But I think as long as you keep things in a sensible order, then, yeah, generally that's fine. I've I've used grid and flexbox for all sorts of layout components. I mean, that kind of thing, building user interfaces is is really, if I do any web development, is that kind of stuff rather than than sort of design, as it were. Um, So, yeah, I think think generally you're fine. It's the the usual thing of of making sure that um, things are in a good order um, so people can tab through them. Yep, gotcha. Thank you. Okay, the next one here. uh, Can grid be used in an EPUB? I don't think 
any of them support it. It's really just support. I mean, um, EPUBs right. and also the, the CSS print things like prints and so on that do PDFs. Um, it really is just like browsers. It's just waiting for things to support. I don't know the situation in EPUB at the moment. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's really just waiting for support as it is, is with browsers. All right, uh, next question here. Uh, would the reverse flow be as weird in a right to left language? Well, in a right to left language, it would just all switch. So if you're in a right to left language and you say um, row reverse, then your items would actually start on the left because they would have reversed themselves. So it's exactly the same, the same problem. Um, it's just it could, because they're working right to left, they then have left to right tabbing, which would be weird to someone who used that, that writing mode. So yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's the thing is, uh, yeah, you, I mean, you could really mess with people, of course, by by setting to the writing mode to RTL and then setting row reverse to setting uh, flex direction to row reverse. And that would just really confuse everybody else. So don't do it. But <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, both grid and flex bots sort of work entirely with writing modes. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, it's going to be the same issue, really. Right. Another one on ordering. How do you address the content box order in different breakpoints? For example, one, two, three, four, five in desktop needs to be rendered in mobile as one, two, three, five, four. So kind of switching the, the mm -hmm. order there. I think that I think this is the reason we want to solve this, basically, yeah. is that there are there are reasons to do this. Um, and that's why I, I get a bit annoyed when people say, oh, no, it, it, it's always should follow the source. That's logical. And you're like, well, yeah, but at which break point? Which one do you pick? I think <laughs> I think for now, I think for now, you kind of have to go for the to, to sort of figure out the order of the content that gives the best approach across everything. If you really have to move things around at different break points, um, it's really a case of testing what will get the kind of the, the least damaging situation really right. uh, or, the, or the least weird situation for the most people um yeah. and, and so it is and, and that's say so that's why i'd like to solve this because i think i think this is the, the case where there isn't really a good answer other than um you're probably gonna have to compromise what you're doing um right which is a shame when we've got the technical ability to do it yeah definitely Okay, we have one a mobile specific question here. With responsive design, oftentimes the same content may be presented differently on mobile and on desktop because of space, uh, mobile specific markup or desktop specific markup. If we remove the CSS, we'll, we will essentially end up with duplicate content. How do we solve for this? Right, yeah, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, that that's sort of... Um... A bit of a different issue uh, where you've actually duplicated your markup for different breakpoints uh, because then you're into the realm of having to hide things um, which is really a slightly different situation to the issue with grid is you know are you hiding stuff in a good way so that someone using a screen reader isn't hearing it twice for example <laughs> you know that that's that's a that's a different issue to um the reordering thing i think the the reordering thing is is going to be an issue in that situation as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think there's probably a couple of things going on there. If you've got how to duplicate content, it's making sure that you're actually hiding it in a good way. Um, because, you know, I think I, the idea is that we have a document that you could whip the CSS off and it would be absolutely fine. Um, but I mean, that's not always the reality. I'm aware of that. Thank you. Okay, question here from Sophie. Uh, are there tips, examples uh, to combine grid uh, flex with progressive enhancement uh, to ensure broad browser support? Yeah, I mean, I've got a ton of stuff online um, that you can yeah. probably search for. If you, I mean, um, I've certainly written stuff on MDN, there's stuff on Smashing Magazine relating to that. Um, yeah, so I mean, really, I think that the key player in this is feature queries, is the, the ad supports um, rule that I, I showed in one of my examples or checking, asking the browser, do you support this stuff? Because then you can overwrite things. So you can do a, a layout for, a, you know, a basic layout in floats and you can overwrite it with grid. Um, so that's really, I think, the, the thing to be to be looking at is, is using feature queries, um, particularly now because they've got they've got great browser support. So you can start testing for for things that aren't supported and, and using them as a progressive enhancement and knowing that then there's none of that's going to leak through to a browser that doesn't support it at all. Right. Thank you, Rachel. Okay, question here from Elliot. How do you deal with overflow problems in grids when the input is user submitted and has a very generous max length? 
Um, grids re- got uh, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's useful for overflow. Um, I mean, things like using um, the min max function. Um, so you can say, so say you'd ideally like your content to be, I don't know, 200 pixels tall. You want a nice, clean sort of layout of design. But you want to make sure that, yes, if somebody comes onto the, CSS, the CMS and puts in some enormous chunk of content, it's not going to overflow. Um, using min max is great for that because you can set the, the minimum to the ideal size um, and the max to auto. And if something is auto, it will extend to, to fill the space for the content. Uh, so min max is useful. Um, some of the other sort of the, the like fit content can be quite handy, that function. There's a whole bunch of stuff in Grid. Um, Grid and Flexbox are both really good at sort of looking at your content if you allow them to and resizing things to fit. Um, sometimes that doesn't give you the ideal layout, but it's better than things overflowing all over the place. So there's usually a way to solve it. Um, let's say min max is, is, a, is, a good, is a good tool to, to start with, though. Okay. Okay. Question from Ronnie. Uh, what other tools can you mention for someone in QA like myself? Uh, I got really excited when you mentioned tab stop checker. Yeah. I mean, that, that accessibility insights um, tool has is, is got a whole bunch of, of useful stuff. Um, I mean, increasingly the browsers are in their dev tools are including things. Um, so, so really I think it's, it's creating that, uh, that collection of things that you know I guess it's sort of for me it's always having a list of stuff I want to check you know so color contrast and tab yeah. stops and you know it's kind of having that list um along with other things you might be checking sort of performance related things or whatever else and that has been part of and it's finding tools that then support you and there's so many of these things now that a lot mm-hmm. of the time it's it's kind of like but which work work best for my workflow and, and the yeah. way that the way that I work. Um, so I think that's kind of um, really is, is just testing all these different tools uh, that people have got and, um, and and find the ones that work best for you. But I think the thing is to, is to include it all in your list of things that you're going to check um, yeah. with the same provenance as anything else. Absolutely. All right. A question from Ames. Are you using any polyfills or just fallback CSS to manage browsers that don't support grid autoflow? Um, for grid, no, I just I just sort of build fallbacks on browsers because now really we're just talking about IE. We're really talking about people who still need to support IE 10 and 11, um, which is, is, you know, Lots of people still do need to support i10 and 11, but that is kind of going away. Um, and increasingly, I think people who are building new sites are happy to give i10 and 11 a simpler layout. Um, so trying to trying to polyfill grid is never going to work that well. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's it's probably better to give those older browsers something that um, suits them. You know, use older techniques because they're going to perform better with that. Gotcha. Looks like we got time for maybe one more question here. Okay, let's go with this one. And an, uh, an accessibility thorn in my side uh, is finding ways to do true responsive tables that work on desktop and mobile. Some solutions suggest display, grid to change the display, uh, but that destroys table semantics in iOS. What would you suggest for responsive tables on mobile uh, for devs? Or yeah, that uh, yeah that that's another thing I would love to be solved is yeah. is the fact that you know again it should not be changing the semantics of the table if we change the the value of display and so I think actually what we need to do is get that problem fixed because we should be able to turn we should be able to turn a a table a semantic table into a grid layout so we can do things in mobile and it not affect the semantics there is no reason that that should be happening other than the fact that these things are hard to implement, I think, you know, and, and this stuff has happened. So, but I think that's the stuff we want to be pushing for is actually to get that changed because all of the solutions aren't great. Um, you know, <laughs> all the, we don't have many options to fix this. Right. Um, and so I think really what we want to do is because you can fix it with grid, but then you don't want to, to, to damage the semantics. So I think that's, again, one of these things we need to fix and we need to get that fixed in browsers so that we can do this because uh, we need to. Definitely. Awesome. Well, we are officially at time. Uh, thank you so much, Rachel, for such a great session and for joining us here at AxCon. Uh, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, you should have about 10 minutes to, to find your next room. Uh, hope you all enjoy the rest of AxCon and, and thanks again, everyone. Thank you.